my delight. Uh, I bought this okay. book recently, okay. and I was so excited to get started reading it. And I'd worked my way through the introduction and a couple of the earlier chapters, and then. I wanted to just actually figure out which of the essays in here were about healthcare. And so I was like, oh, look at this one. I want to read this one on the anti-vax movement. What, a, what an important time for me to be reading that essay. So I, I flipped ahead in the book. I was like, oh, I want to read this essay. And lo and behold, Jonathan yep. Howard, how exciting <laughs> to, to be able to see you again. So I love how... Um, I have crossed paths uh, serendipitously yeah. now twice with, with your work. Oh, I'm glad that you, you liked it. That chapter, I wrote that in my sleep. I mean, I'm very familiar for better or for worse. And, you know, a lot of people are sort of scared of the anti-vaccine movement at this time. But I mean, if, if God willing, you know, at some point in the future, you know, the most optimistic I'm hearing is the fall, but we have a, we have a vaccine and there are people saying, I'll be last in line. All right, fine with me. <laughs> 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 so maybe this is a time. Maybe this is a time where the anti-vaccine movement's okay. I mean, obviously, I'm I'm, I'm joking. Yes, um, but yeah, I mean, I I was hoping that maybe this would be a chance uh, to help people challenge uh, their fears. Uh, maybe this would be a time for them to learn more about the science of vaccines. Maybe this would be a time where they would feel that some of those concerns that you raised in the essay, maybe maybe this will be a time that maybe we can make some progress. Yeah, uh, well, it's, in, it, it, it's interesting. I mean, you know, someone asked on Twitter, you know, after this, will there be anti-vaxxers? And it was very clear that he didn't know much about anti-vaxxers because, um, you know, and, and, and there's, there's a range. I mean, it's not, you know, yes, no, pro-vaccine, anti-vaccine. I mean, there, there's a range. I mean, even now, you know, I said that hopefully there'll be a coronavirus vaccine in, in, in six months. I mean, would I take that? Well, I, I don't know. I'd, I'd have to, you know, read about its safety and efficacy. And obviously, uh, these are very unprecedented times. I'm not a, a, a vaccine researcher myself uh, at all. I think I have one paper, paper on uh, vaccines and multiple sclerosis, but I, I know a lot about the anti-vaccine movement just because I've followed it for many years. Um, and, 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 processes that normally take decades are being sped up in months. And, you know, one of the main complaints that the anti-vaccine movement has is that vaccines have never really been studied, that there's no sort of long-term placebo-controlled safety studies. And, you know, if a vaccine is approved too soon, um, they'll be right. And that doesn't mean that it's going to be a bad vaccine necessarily, but, you know, they'll, they'll have a point that Safety studies were rushed, steps were skipped. Um, you know, it still might not be the wrong thing to do. I've myself volunteered to be in a vaccine trial here at NYU. We'll see if they write me back. Um, you know, these studies only work if people volunteer, so. Yeah, but those are, those are very logical and scientifically based concerns around following an appropriate protocol for the best of science as we know it. But one of the things that I find so compelling about your research is that it seems as if you take the role of human decision making and the vulnerability to bias as serious in your practice as a medical practitioner mm -hmm. as you do the, the science and, and practice of, of medicine itself. And I think that that puts you in this um, very powerful position and a very important position. And I'd, I'd love to understand more about how did you come to uh, have this passion in, in studying bias and, and making that uh, something that you seem to spend so much of your free time <laughs> uh, devoted to, is studying and understanding bias in, in, in things like uh, even, even in the realm of, of yeah. vaccines. So how did this so, come about for you? I mean, a few, a few caveats. You know, I'm not, um, I, I don't do much primary research in, in this. I'm sort of a collector. Um, that, that's how I describe myself. You know, some of my, most of my other writing is in neurology. I've, I've written sort of a, you know, textbook on uh, neuroradiology, neuroimaging, same thing there. There's nothing new, but over the past decade, I've, I've collected everything that exists in neuroradiology and, you know, wrote a, wrote a page summary about it. So I'm not doing primary, you know, research about this. Um, you know, a, a lot of the work of, of people who are going to be doing these talks uh, is involved. And, uh, you know, I'm not the first one to think about this either. There's, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Pat Crosscarry, 
um, I, th I think up in Canada, you know, who's, who's really sort of studied. And, and Jerome Grubman wrote this book, you know, How Doctors Think. Um, you know, when I first entered medical school, uh, you know, I thought that sort of everything had been studied and everything, every, I thought that everything in medicine or a lot of things were sort of like gross anatomy. You know, we're not going to discover any new bones, any new nerves anytime soon. You know, everything that we know about, we, we kind of already knew. I mean, there's going to be new treatments and, you know, potentially new emerging diseases. But for the most part, things have been really well studied. And, and boy, that's not true. And what isn't taught in medicine is sort of critical thinking, you know, how do you think about what decisions you make? Um, you know, a patient could go to uh, two different doctors with the same complaint, you know, say a headache and, you know, one doctor could be very sort of conservative and say, okay, you know, try Tylenol and call me if that doesn't get better. And another doctor could say, okay, we're going to do an MRI, we're going to do a spinal tap, and we're going to do all of these sort of tests, and we're going to give you Botox and, 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 and both doctors could potentially justify their decision. And, uh, you know, how do, how do people sort of make those decisions and, and, and where are they right and where are they wrong? I think one thing, um, one mistake uh, when people talk about biases is to think that they're talking about flaws or errors or mistakes. And, you know, I think that's why Pat Crosscarry sometimes uses the, the term cognitive disposition to respond. It's a little, <laughs> it's a little clumsier, but it, but it sort of takes away um, you know, the, 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 the negative connotation, right? Again, back to the, you know, the, the patient who has a headache, you know, Dr. A might be sort of very conservative and say, you know, first do no harm. And, um, you know, you know, you probably don't have a brain tumor and Dr. B might be sort of very anxious and, you know, oh my God, what if I miss a brain tumor? Uh, so, the, so that sort of thing. So how do sort of doctors make those decisions and when are they right and when are they wrong? That's very good. And, and also, um, in addition to looking at practitioners and, and uh, uh, medical practitioners, you also take into consideration the role of these, uh, you know, cognitive shortcuts in patient decision making. Right. I mean, you know, you, you, you can't um, spend all day making every single decision, uh, you know, looking up every single study that's been done and, and, and you can't sort of help how, how a patient makes you feel in, in some ways. Um, there are patients that we like, there are patients that we may not like as much, there are diseases that I feel more comfortable with, um, you know, even things how much I've slept, am I hungry, uh, you know, all of these factors can, uh, can affect decision making in, in ways that, that are sort of not thought about, not, are, you know, it's becoming more thought about, but they weren't taught in, in medical school to me um, at all. It's, be, it's becoming a little bit more, more common to do that. Um, and, you know, I'm seeing this playing out right now in front of me in real time, treating COVID, treating coronavirus. So, um, for example, um, I can talk a little bit about my experience being here in New York City, but every patient that was admitted uh, to, I, I work primarily at Bellevue treating this, um, but I think the same is true at NYU and probably uh, multiple other cities, was placed on Plaquenil, hydroxychloroquine, this, this anti-malarial or, or sort of a rheumatological drug based on what? Based on a couple of stories and, and you know, the right-wing media really, really sort of promoting it. Not that many people who were using it uh, probably were fans of Sean Hannity and Donald Trump. Um, so, so why? And, and I think a lot of that was just this feeling that we got to do something, you know, you know, doing nothing is, you know, unacceptable in this situation. And, um, you know, I, I didn't take that position. You know, I said, uh, you know, when I became, you know, when I got my COVID team, I said, you know, uh, we're not going to do any experiments on patients outside of clinical trials. So that was my attitude. Now, there might be some situations where that is actually the wrong thing to do. So allow me to talk about one of the, the myriad complications of this disease is, and it's been getting a lot of press, is that a lot of patients are getting a lot of blood clots. I've never seen so many patients be so hypercoagulable. So we've seen young people with strokes. Um, we have seen pulmonary emboli. That's when the blood clot that probably starts in your leg goes into your lungs, you know, fatal often. Um, and I have seen patients lose limbs due to blood clots in their legs. So, so some of these patients are, are very you know, pro-clot. Pro and you know, some doctors feel 
um, that we should not really change our practice about how to prevent clots in these patients because you know, this one virus doesn't change everything. If we put patients on more intense anticoagulation, um, you know, we run the risk of maybe them bleeding and that would be problematic. Other doctors feel, holy smokes, these patients are clotting left and right in front of me. I'm gonna put everyone, or at least patients who I think are at high risk, on this sort of higher dose anticoagulation. So we're having to make these decisions in real time without a study. Studies are being done, but they're not done yet. You know, so what do you do? I mean, you could make two mistakes. You could fail to give one patient proper dose of anticoagulation and they could clot with catastrophic consequences, or you could be sort of hyper aggressive and put your patients at risk of bleeding with also catastrophic consequences. So, you know, how do doctors balance those risks and make those decisions in the absence of evidence? Um, you know, those are all questions that, that interest me. That's excellent. Um, and so how, I mean, I, I want to follow that up with, so how do you reconcile that? I think that that's one of the things about uh, behavioral economics. There's, there's this fascinating tension between, uh, you know, sometimes it's called kind of the system one and system two. Yeah. That's a very convenient heuristic for how people think. And there's a tension, a uh, fundamental tension within the field between um, providing more uh, support and, and rationale and, and um, confidence even in system one thinking. Uh, because we can't always take that super logical balance, wait for the RCT and then act in accordance yeah. with that. So, so how do you balance, um, you know, using a strong possible kind of system one or we don't have the data uh, yeah. to guide to guide us and yet we need to recognize the role that bias could still play how do you how are you balancing that in in your clinical decisions um you know well probably unconsciously that's you know um i, I don't sort of you know too often think i am now using system one i'm now using system two you, you know the, the 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 controversy with the anticoagulation i think that you know that can be system two just in and of itself i mean these are not people making you know fly by you know instantaneous decisions and instantaneous impressions i mean we do that um you know i can see someone back when people were walking down the streets here you know walk down the street and like oh there's someone with parkinson's there's someone who has a cerebellar problem if their feet are very wide apart so i could just make these sort of you know instant you know and this does not take a high degree of skill but um you know these sort of instantaneous diagnoses are you know know exactly where the problem is um not always right um, but that's that's a sort of more system one type thing. Um, you know, with the anticoagulation issue, I think that is, you know, two doctors could get together and have a half an hour discussion about what the right thing to do is. And it reflects more their personality at this point than the right thing to do. Would I, if a patient is going to have a bad outcome, would I rather have it be the process of the natural disease or something that I cause? You know, so some doctors may say, you know, I, you know, definitely don't want to cause any problems. And the problem that I cause is worse than one that's natural. You know, another doctor might say, that's not true at all. And, you know, patients throwing these horrific clots is, is unacceptable and we have to do something right now. So it was, it was, it was fascinating to see that. Um, you know, I think probably the hydroxychloroquine, that is system one a little bit. You know, that is people, um, you know, just sort of doing what everyone else is doing, you know, assuming that, you know, doctors like myself who are a little bit balder and grayer, you know, who are starting this medicine are wiser about things and know more. And they, you know, that's not true. We all heard about this disease at the same time. So I think that was probably a lot more reflexive and thoughtless. And um, um, that's so what bothered we me. have so many things ahead of us in terms of um, understanding the root causes of COVID-19 and how we ended up here in the first place. I'd love to hear your point of view on that and the role that popular sentiment plays in the origins of, of COVID-19. I'd like to know uh, your thoughts about that and then what kinds of behaviors might need yeah. to change as a consequence of it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I have no sort of inside knowledge. I mean, I suppose you could say that the Chinese officials were the original sort of guilty party of burying their heads in the sand and suppressing reports about this and minimizing its dangers, even after they apparently knew um, about its effects. Um, the, you know, they, they had this big festival in Wuhan, you know, 
six hundred thousand people gathered together. So, you know, they're 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 sort of really the original, you know, ostrich um, uh, in, in in the sand type thing. Um, you know, so I think you know the origins of it are pretty clear. Conspiracy theories aside, I mean, um, you know, it probably came from a wildlife market. Maybe it came from a lab, even if that was sort of an accidental release. You know, that's not completely implausible. Um, uh, but, you know, I think the idea that it was sort of engineered by Bill Gates to microchip us all is probably um, a, a little bit far-fetched. Um, you know, and then it's, it's, it's you know, it's really revealed a, a lot about countries, um, a lot about people. I mean, you know, traits that I would have thought about uh, in the past, you know, that would have been sort of, you know, good American traits, uh, you know, don't seem to be serving us well during this time. You know, countries that are sort of very obedient and compliant. I mean, it's almost like a knife in my heart to say, yes, citizens should obey, with thought, <laughs> you know, their government without question. Um, you know, but those are the, you know, at least a, con a country where there's a, a, a strong trust in institutions, I should say, you know, that, that if a, a leader gets on TV and says it's very important that you stay inside for the next month, um, you know, that its citizens don't view that as, you know, an attempt to, you know, you know, become the police state forevermore, that it's an attempt to stop the spread of a, a deadly virus. And, you know, it's really brought out the best in a lot of people. I mean, um, you know, so many people flocked here to New York City to help us. Um, and that was very heartwarming. I, I, you know, I think, you know, a lot of people, you know, who are able to are donating to charity now and sort of helping out neighbors and, you know, this sort of thing. And so that's, that's the best. And then, you know, the worst is what I talked about, this sort of, you know, you know, whether it's sort of careless, careless college kids being like, I'm going to go party, you know, screw Corona, you know, um, I'll probably be fine. Uh, you know, who cares about grandma and, uh, you know, some of the sort of really more nefarious parts of our, our society bonding together in, in, in scary ways. Yes. Um, so one of the things that you've written a lot about is, is, um, is pseudoscientific um, beliefs and the role that bias plays in magnifying those. Um, how do you think uh, people can uh, potentially overcome those biases and, and why? Why do we have um, such pervasiveness of pseudoscientific thinking? Yeah, so there was some research that something like 40% of Americans believed at least one sort of conspiracy thinking. And very interestingly, for the first time, uh, one of the conspiracies is that there already is a vaccine for this, but it's sort of being hidden. Um, that, that in retrospect was kind of a predictable conspiracy, but usually vaccines are sort of bad, 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 you know, evil. So it's kind of interesting to see the reverse conspiracy. Um, and I, 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 you know, I think for a lot of people, um, conspiracy theories are very comforting. Uh, you know, even if someone who is sort of you know, bad and evil and very powerful, at least someone's in charge, someone is directing this, you know, things aren't sort of randomly happening. And if you take the view that I do, um, that really no one's in charge and things are kind of random, you know, just bad, you know, bad things kind of randomly happen. I mean, that's what's really scary, right? Uh, because, um, you know, I don't know how this is gonna, no one knows how this is gonna end. And I, I, I think that's sort of the scariest part. You know, when you look back on, events like this in, in the past. I mean, you know, horrible times in the past, you know, the depression, World War II, the 1918 pandemic, which never seems to get a lot of attention until now for what it's worth. Um, you know, those seemed, looking back, you know, what would have been like to have been alive, you know, you can sort of trick yourself into thinking, oh, it wouldn't have been so bad because you knew how it ended. You knew the pandemic ended, you knew the depression ended, you knew World War II ended with the good guys winning. And, and, and we don't know that that's gonna be the case here. I mean, we, we will end. Of course, you know, this pandemic is not going to go on for the next hundred years, but we, we don't know how, we don't know when, we don't know if it's going to end with a vaccine, with a, you know, viral mutation that makes it more benign or with a lot more graves yet to be dug. Um, and so I think the conspiracy theories really give people some sort of framework to, to, to think about things and to, 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 to avoid that. And, you know, the conspiracy theories are very predictable in that, um, you know that that the hardcore conspiracy theorists, the ones who blame this on vaccines or microchips, I mean, you know, these are not stupid people. You know, RFK Jr., I think, was even sort of saying that, um, 
it's a plot by Bill Gates to you know, track us all, th things like that. Um, you know, you know that they're going to be against the vaccine. So again, let's say there's good news. And in six months, this group working in the UK, you know, feels that they're confident that this vaccine is safe and it's effective. Um, and, you know, it's given to 100 million people and bad things are going to happen to some of those people after they get the vaccine, if you give it to that many people. And invariably, the anti-vaxxers will say, um, you know, the vaccine, you know, caused this. And there'll be stories on the news. There'll be you know, heartbreaking things. You know, my healthy 14-year-old daughter was fine until she got the coronavirus vaccine. And then, you know, now she can't walk, you know, look at, look at her now. So th th those are going to be very, very predictable, you know, if we get a vaccine and there's no guarantee of that. Um, so I, you know, on, on the one hand, I have some sympathy for some of these conspiracy theorists in that they're just looking for an organizing framework to sort of make sense of the, the world. Um, on the other hand, I have very little cons uh, sympathy because they're standing you know, in crowds now protesting and you know, doing everything they can to spread the virus and convince people that it's not a big deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a very, very uh, dangerous uh, way to, to you know, respond um, because literally putting themselves and and their families uh, in in risk way when uh, you know you might disagree with the public policy, but there's different ways, hopefully, to express that discontent that doesn't actually put you in the line of fire, but, but here we are. Yeah, um, the most extreme, you know, people, you know, say that it's a hoax, that, you know, there was this movement, you know, film your hospital, I don't know if you saw that at all, you know, sort of encouraging people to go stand outside hospitals and film them. And you know, from the outside, they looked exactly the same. I don't, you know, it wasn't a movie scene. I mean, maybe in some parts of New York City, it, it was, I take that back. But, you know, most hospitals were on the outside, relatively quiet, actually, you know, patients stopped coming to the emergency room for non COVID related things. It was this very weird time where the whole hospital was COVID. And, um, you know, of course, all non emergent uh, you know, surgeries were stopped. We weren't having any visitors. We still don't have visitors. Um, you know, so from the outside, things looked pretty tranquil. It wasn't, again, it wasn't a scene out of movies, you know, a contagion or pandemic, you know, people sort of running wild and screaming. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so at, at the, you know, I've had people online tell me that I have not seen what I've seen, you know, they, I say, you know, there are giant refrigerated trucks outside my hospital to store the dead bodies, you know, they're not there to store the dead bodies. They're there to trick you. I've seen, you know, I've seen people being carried. Well, you know, no, you have. You know, so, um, you know, the, the the conspiracy theory in mind is 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 the more you try to uh, uh, counter it, the more in some ways you can end up reinforcing it, which is a very difficult thing, um, you know, to tr to to try to do. And you know, I think in this point, I'm I'm pretty happy although they could do a little bit better, some of the social media sites, you know, taking down some of these really dangerous videos. I mean, again, that's another thing that sort of five years ago would have been like a stake in my, <laughs> my heart if I, had, you know, YouTube should ban this person, you know, but, you know, when they're out there saying, you know, you know, don't take this seriously, go party with grandma, go visit her at the nursing, you know, uh, you know, I haven't quite heard that, but, uh, you know, similar things are equally dangerous things. Uh, I have no problems with private companies saying, you know, we don't want this on our platform any more than, you know, go drive drunk or go shoot up, uh, you know, a mosque or a synagogue, for example. Right. Or, or, you know, shouting fire in a, in a crowded theater in a way yeah. that, leads to, that leads to harm. So another thing then that I think that you've been exposed to through your career, um, just building on your point about um, one of the things that conspiracy theories do is help people um, have a sense making uh, mechanism. Um, and so they go about searching for information to, you know, um, help make sense of all of this. Um, and that's the role of um, people falling prey to quacks versus legitimate experts. And there's a couple of questions that I want to ask you about that and let you respond to this and take it apart how, how you would like to. Um, how should the average lay person make a distinction between a quote unquote quack? How would they know that that person is a quack um, versus somebody who's actually, it seems as if they're putting forward a controversial well thought out point of view to protect other people um, versus an expert. And, and I'd, I'd also like to relay that to, to you. 
um, one of the things that we talk a lot about, one of the challenges of science, and, and that's reflected in this, uh, in this uh, book edited by you know, James Kaufman and Alison Kaufman, is um, experts playing in their own lane. Yeah. So, so, how, so how should the layperson make that distinction between an expert and a quack? And then how do you, as someone who has studied the role of bias as a scientific thinker and a scientist, I try. You, and, and how do you make that distinction? Yeah. Well, it can be very hard, I think. Um, a lot of experts have been very wrong about this disease. Um, a lot of very smart, I think, well-meaning people have made really wrong and potentially catastrophic predictions, you know, people who are clearly non-quacks, at least I, to me, I, I thought. You know, I think some of the quacks are sort of pretty easy to spot. I mean, Dr. Oz, you know, Alex Jones, and, and the sort of very sort of far out there people. I know, though, they have a huge audience, and, 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 a, and a lot of people sort of feel that they're getting the truth, the unvarnished truth. Um, and what, you know, how do you spot the experts? I, I suppose at this point, um, the, the most humble person, the person who says, I don't know the most, <laughs> is probably the one who I would trust the most because there's so many mysteries uh, about this disease, both on an individual level and on a larger level. You know, I talked to you before about some of the controversies about how to take care of these patients. I didn't even get into to all of them. You know, are we intubating patients too soon? You know, I was, I'm not an intensive care doctor, so I, I wasn't the one, you know, at the side of making that decision. But, you know, the, that's a big decision, um, you know, a big sort of debate uh, amongst uh, doctors. And, and then, you know, other mysteries about this disease, again, on an individual level. Why does, why do, it seems, most people have no symptoms. I, I've read about you know, certain places where they've tested nearly 400 people who tested positive. There was a pork plant in Missouri and none of them had symptoms. Maybe they were about to get symptoms if you kept following them for a few days. So they're maybe not asymptomatic, maybe they're pre-symptomatic, but that seems to be common. You know, why do other people die? Why are children, thank God, that's the only good thing about this disease. Why are they, with a few rare exceptions, not hit hard by this disease, although it's not zero? Um, and then sort of on a bigger level, why, why are some cities hit so much harder than others? I, I think New York City um, had it the worst in the world. Why? It, was it, in any, there, there, there's no reasonable explanation for this. Um, you know, were, were people getting to, you know, in close quarters, you know, was one person on a subway, you rode with them for an hour and they infected 50 people in very close contact, you know, because we tend to think about people, um, I'm getting a little bit off subject from the uh, experts, not experts, but I'll get to that. Um, yeah. You know, is, you know, we tend to think about people infected or not, but that's probably not true. The mode of infection and the degree and severity of infection may matter. You know, people 500 years ago knew that getting a little bit of smallpox was better than getting a lot of smallpox, you know, so, so they would, you know, ahead of an epidemic, they would try to infect themselves a, a little bit, even though it was a very dangerous thing, don't try it at home. Um, you know, so what else about, you know, but that, but that plenty of places have extremely cramped you know, dense quarters. Um, are Americans just unhealthier? Yes. You know, uh, you know, are, you know, is there more sort of obesity and diabetes and hypertension, and renal failure or renal, you know, renal uh, disease that, that predisposes to this? Yes. Um, but it still doesn't explain to me why New York City suffered so horribly. And even different neighborhoods in New York City that were right next to each other suffered massively different rates of this. Um, there was an article in the New York Times about the, yesterday about the rates in two neighborhoods in Queens, Corona versus, ironically, Corona, <laughs> uh, named Corona, um, uh, you know, had a much, much worse uh, time with this than, than flushing. And, and why are, you know, other areas have been very hard hit, you know, the UK, Lombardy region of, of Italy, France, but we haven't heard, and I hope we don't, you know, uh, and this is, I think we were all thinking this, I certainly was, that this would just sort of ravish um, you know, African countries and Asian countries and, um, you know, South America and, 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 and maybe, again, please no, I hope it doesn't, maybe that's about to happen, but, you know, just not, I mean, countries like, you know, Vietnam and Thailand, I think I might be getting that wrong, but, uh, you know, it's, a, you know, a lot of Singapore, I think, have done a very, very good job, and, and it, but it's unclear why, it's not like they have, you know, um, you know, they have, uh, you know, more health resources in the United States, but maybe they do. I mean, maybe, you know, 
you know, one of the health resources that America has not uh, invested in is public health. And that, you know, when your public health commissioner says, stay inside and wear a mask, if you have to come out, those countries were like, I'm staying inside, I'm gonna wear a mask if I have to come out. Um, and so, I, again, I think it's in some ways very easy to spot the sort of uber quacks. You know, one thing, one, one characteristic, one rule uh, of thumb that always served me well is they're, they're the ones who are not working with actual COVID patients. So, um, you know, if someone promises a cure or says that it's not real or germ theory isn't real or who knows, those are not the doctors who you'll, you will find in the ERs and the ICUs and, and sort of on, on the front lines. Um, and then when it comes to experts, I mean, certain experts have gotten this wrong. Um, a man who I admired, at least his writings a lot, I've never met him, and hopefully I'm going to say his name right, John Ioannidis, or Ioannidis, um, uh, I don't know if that's someone that, that you've heard of, but he was, he's an epidemiologist at Stanford and a really, you know, powerful advocate for, you know, science done well, um, and there's a lot of bad science being done right now, and um, he consistently, consistently minimized the dangers that this would do, um, sometime in February or March, he wrote an article, you know, this will lead to 10,000 deaths. And then a few weeks later, this will lead to 40,000 deaths. And um, he went on Fox News shows. And, and this is someone who none of us had ever sort of thought of as political before. And, you know, he still may not be, but he sort of consistently underestimated the harms of this disease. So even with these experts, you have to be careful a a as well. And that's why I say a degree of, of you know, the expert who says, I don't know, we're still learning about this, you know, um, is, is the one that, that you should trust the most. And then when it comes to sort of giving advice, um, you know, I, I think, you know, an expert can sort of say, here's what I think is going to happen, um, but we got to plan for the worst case scenario. You know, so we have to, 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 you know, I don't think, you know, the virus is going to do much damage, but we have to react as, as if it is. And uh, so, so those are the, the experts that, that I would trust. That's right, and I, I think that it's it's just so unfortunate that uh, people like Dr. Oz and Alex Jones have such a huge platform, um, because with that comes the perception of authority and the social proof that they get from those mainstream platforms. It must make uh, your job just exceptionally more difficult when you are working with your patients and helping to shape and advise their treatment plan or diagnostic acceptance. Um, so, so this issue of how to understand um, you know, parsing out experts and then the experts amongst the experts and experts being wrong yeah. um, is, is an exceptionally challenging expectation that we have of our fellow citizens. Yeah, I mean, I think working with COVID patients, you know, that hasn't been a problem because all the ones I've taken care of have been very sick, sick enough to be in the hospital. Um, you know, I, I think those people are probably doing more harm on a societal level you know, by spreading, by minimizing this disease and, and, and spreading, you know, misinformation about this and, you know, the you know, social distancing, you know, we don't need to do that, the, the, this sort of thing. So I, you know, in my previous life, which hopefully we'll return to as a multiple sclerosis doctor, you know, there, there I saw that a lot, you know, patients sort of falling for, you know, quick fixes and easy cures. Because let's face it, what I'm saying right now um, isn't cool, fun, sexy, interesting. I'm not a brave maverick doctor, you know, going against the grain saying, you know, everyone else is wrong. I'm not telling people what they want to hear, right? I mean, I wish Dr. Ioannidis had been right. I, I wish this was gonna cause 10,000 deaths or 40,000 deaths. I wish the fatality rate turns out to be less than one in a thousand. And if we just close nursing homes, you know, everything the rest of us can get on about our lives, you know. So it, it's not that I, that, and again, I don't want to put him in the sort of Dr. Oz class quite yet. Um, uh, you know, but, but doctors who convey humility and uncertainty and even the sort of mainstream, you know, I'm not going to, you know, get on Fox News or, you know, anything like that. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm nobody. Um, you know, there were these two doctors too, these two emergency room doctors in Bakersfield, California, who made this viral video about, you know, so that you know, they were no one before. You know, but just consistently um, downplaying the dangers of this disease, and you know that that's just really unfortunate. That's right. Yeah, and uh, one of the things that we learned in terms of people's perception of climate change 
was how much uh, that perception fell along ideological lines in terms of, of, of belief or, or resistance. And one of the pieces of research that really struck me um, in terms of trying to understand why do things fall along those ideological lines um, was um, the concern about the means to, re to resolving that issue um, become things that hit against uh, yeah. those ideological beliefs. So a system or a solution that requires more state level intervention, centralization in terms of uh, planning, things that do go against the grain of individual freedom, then we've got those and, you know, kind of a, a lack of trust in the government, then, then um, the, if, if the means to solving the problem contravene that underlying ideology, it makes it harder to accept the problem statement in the first place. Yeah, that, and that, so, that. that's yeah. right. And so if we're able to actually find where we can agree on, on the end state, then maybe we could start to find those zones of, of agreement and compromise within the means to, to get there. And so COVID-19 seems to be paralleling many of the lessons that we've learned through these other global type problems that require global type solutions. And so uh, one of the things that I have been impressed by is when businesses have taken active stances in developing innovative solutions, um, everything from uh, helping to develop, uh, you know, masks. There's a furniture company that's been uh, cranking out massive quantities of masks for both public consumption as well as for healthcare workers. Uh, we've seen uh, innovation in terms of trying to produce everything from uh, redesign and ventilators, generating ventilators, generating, uh, uh, providing the uh, other kinds of uh, nebulizers and breathing pumps. Uh, businesses responding some some in just mere philanthropic ways and others in you know helping to re-engineer solutions and and I think that bodes well for potentially being able to understand the severity of the problem if we see a convergence between business and public health intervention on working towards solutions yeah you know, that, that goes back to what I said before about, you know, how horrible it is that this has been sort of politicized, um, you know, just basic facts. But, you know, one potential upside of sort of having a AWOL federal government um, has been that it has, you know, people have not sort of sat back and said, you know, let me, you know, let me be taken care of, you know, let, you know, uh, you know let's find a solution. So I saw that, you know, here in my hospital, um, you know, we were deluged and, um, you know, a lot of rooms were converted like that to negative pressure rooms, you know, so, so the air is blowing outside, not, not, not inside. Uh, a lot of very innovative things happened. You know, IV poles were placed outside of patients' rooms so that people could, you know, change medications without going into the room. And then, you know, the science here has moved at a, at a sort of warp speed in some ways. You know, the virus was identified like that. It was sequenced like that. Tests were developed like that, PCR tests, even though the United States got their version wrong. Um, and, and, and I hope that this continues at pace. I've read today that people are trying to develop um, tests for it uh, and, and maybe on their way to doing it, they claim success as simple as a home pregnancy test. You know, wouldn't that be sort of amazing if you could take that? Antibody tests were developed, although those are potentially problematic. And you know, God willing, the most important thing is a vaccine will be developed. Um, and let me just backtrack a little bit to what I was saying before about experts and John Ioannidis is, you know, him uh, underestimating the severity of this disease. That was very common. Um, I think a lot of us, probably all of us felt, um, you know, this will stay in China. This is what happens over there. You know, oh, this happens in Iran. You know, this is far away. You know, we won't, you know, this movie stuff we won't see in, in our lifetimes. Um, on Twitter at the very end of February, a doctor asked, you know, are you concerned about COVID? And uh, probably half the responses were, I'm more concerned about the panic due to COVID, I'm more concerned about the flu. Um, you know, I wouldn't be bringing it up if I didn't happen to sort of say, yes, I'm, <laughs> I'm very concerned, you know. Um, but what was interesting is my hospital had an inspection. There's a, a, um, a, a regulatory body which, which does inspections, and we had this in February. 
and you know we passed but if you look back it was I don't want to say this without getting in trouble, but sort of all the nonsense, uh, you know, um, you know, our nurses drinking water at their nursing station, or is every single form dotted that, um, you know, documented that the patient was spoken to in their native language and the translator is documented, you know, it's not quite nonsense, but in, in, the, in the face of what to come, it was nonsense. There was no sort of thought that this could come here. And, you know, I was thinking this. I was thinking in February, this could get really bad. Um, you know, why not? Uh, but I didn't go to my hospital administrator and say, he probably would have thought I was crazy, and say, listen, we got to prepare like this is coming here. We got to make sure that we have masks. We got to make sure that we have protection. We have to make sure that we have a plan in place in case 500 people show up to our ICU who need to be intubated. Um, you know, I, I wish I had done that. I don't think it would have changed anything. He probably would have thought of me as a lunatic and then a, then a sort of prophet of sorts. Um, but, but, you know, so we, we all had our head in the sand. There were a few people who were sort of saying ahead of time, you know, you've got to take this very seriously, very, very early on. Um, I think Joe Biden was one, so. Oh, very good. And even, you know, the infrastructure to deal with these wasn't there. You know, so so it was it was it's not, it wasn't a failure just in January and February and March. It was a failure in the years before that under Trump. So one of the other uh, things that I was curious about your point of view on is uh, telemedicine and how that's changing so quick. Yeah, so I mean, there are going to be sort of silver linings to to all of this badness, and I think the you know, the, the speeding up of telemedicine, something that would have taken a decade um, before, now took a month, and I think that was a, a good thing. Um, it depends on what sort of field you practice. Um, you know, I, I imagine certain doctors could do 100% telemedicine. Um, they might disagree with me, but sort of endocrinologists, you know, treating diabetes or, or, or thyroid problems where, you know, the physical exam isn't super duper important, and then, you know, other doctors, obviously, you have to be in the room. Um, I think for me, it's, it's been great, at least with patients who I've known for many years, and I, you know, know the, what, they're, what they're like, and they can tell me if they're different, and I don't have to, you know, start from scratch. It's a little bit hard to do a neuro exam um, via Zoom or via Skype or what have you, but it can be done. Um, I think for newer patients, it, it, it's not quite as good because I don't feel I know them yet, and there are certain things that I can't do look in the back of their eye, hit their knees with a hammer. You know, as a neurologist, we really sort of value uh, those, you know, low-tech, high-yield physical exam things. Um, but from a patient's point of view, it, it is great. You know, they, they sometimes had to travel an hour to see me and pay, by the time they're done, you know, $50 in parking. And, um, you know, for some of our more disabled patients, especially having to uh, you know, get transportation, and it would take two hours each way, and the, you know, so I, I, I think speeding that up, um, you know, will be very good. Invariably, there'll be things that will be missed. There'll be things that I will miss in a in a telemedicine visit that maybe I would have found in person, and it's still not as intimate. You know, I think, you know, this is why we have chosen, you know, as long as possible to to meet face to face. Uh, you know, this is why telemedicine didn't occur already, but I, but I think it will have all those advantages, and you know you could potentially see patients from very far destinations, and it'll, it'll, it'll really change things, and I think that'll be an advantage. What kind of advice would you give to a new uh, doctor who currently the curriculum, based on the research that I've looked at, uh, has very little information about uh, decision-making uh, biases and errors. What kind of advice would you give to um, our new um, healthcare or emerging healthcare workers about how to inform their practice with, this, uh, with these insights? Yeah, so it's questionable whether learning about these biases really helps you overcome them. Um, if that was the case, I would never make a mistake again, I suppose. And, um, you know, I have, you know, as I was writing certain chapters, I was sort of in the process of uh, making those mistakes in real time with, with certain patients. You know, there was a, um, uh, you know, a, a prisoner who came in 
and, and I saw him, and I'll try to be very vague about the details, but we see a lot of uh, people in police custody here, and a lot of them, my, my initial reaction about this is that they're faking. And it's, I'm not saying this in a, in a proud way, um, but you know, I've seen a lot of guys who would rather be here than in central booking than our Rikers Island. And I, I don't blame them. Uh, I think that can be very, I would rather be here than there too. Um, but, so that's my, over the you know, 15 years I've been doing this, that's my sort of gut instinct. And there was a guy who came in with you know, leg weakness and he really wasn't cooperating. You know, Can you lift up your legs? All right, you know, when did this begin? A while ago. You know, how bad is it? You know, bad. You know, it just, you know, wasn't really kind of helping me. So I did some of the studies I needed to do to, 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 to rule out a severe process, but not all of them. And he came back the next day with, with stuff that he couldn't fake. He couldn't move his facial muscles. So being aware of these biases doesn't prevent you from making them. But, but it can help in certain ways in that sort of as an individual level, you can sort of say, okay, I'm going to see a prisoner right now. I know my tendency is to not believe them. I'm not proud of this fact, and, um, but, but it is, it's, 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 it's who I am. It's an involuntary thing. And sort of maybe I can sort of overcompensate in the opposite direction. And then I think having structural things, things that you can't do quite as an individual, maybe you can do them as an individual, um, but recognize that if you're feeling tired, you're not making your best decisions. Recognize that if you're hungry, you're not making your best decisions. I was sort of taught, you know, saying I'm tired is a sign of weakness. I think that's a little bit changing in, in medicine, but, you know, if I had said uh, as a medical student, I'm tired, you know, I need to go take a little nap and I think I'll be a better doctor after a 30 minute nap, that would have been you know, as if I was like, I'm going to go, you know, have a few beers on the job. Um, and, and, and setting things up to where if, if other people feel you're making a mistake, they're not afraid to speak up. So, for example, one thing that I sometimes try to do is assign people, you know, assign one person on the team to tell me everything I'm doing is wrong. And their job is to, to say, no, here, you know, here's why you're wrong. Uh, you know, so that makes sure that that People aren't afraid to speak their minds, and if they counteract, you know, if they, they contradict me, I'm not going to be mad at them. You know, sort of quite the opposite, um, and even sort of very subtle things about how cases are presented. So to go back to that prisoner, um, if the case was presented to me as follows, you know, this is a 23 year old prisoner who comes in with two days of leg weakness. I'm going to feel differently about that than if I hear this is a 22 year old medical student who comes in with, you know, I'm just going to have a very natural you know, different feeling about those two, two cases and the likelihood of, of it, it being real. Um, so the best way to present it is this is a 22 year old man who comes in with two days of leg weakness. And so that's what I try to, to teach students to do. Um, but one of the themes that, uh, I'm not the first one to think about this, uh, there's an emergency room doctor who wrote a blog who really sort of um, clued me into this, is, is, is a lot of these biases are sort of opposite of each other. Basically, every mistake in medicine can be doing too much or doing too little, being too soft, being too hard, not aggressive enough, too aggressive. And if you're going to correct for one mistake, you're more likely to make the other. So I just got done saying, you know, I'm going to go into this prisoner thinking you know, that he's fake it. So maybe I'll take it extra seriously. Okay. And so that may lead me to do unnecessary, potentially dangerous studies. Maybe I, you know, every prisoner who comes in with a headache gets a CT scan. And over the course of the year, I've radiated 100 brains that I didn't need to radiate. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a little skeptical that, that just knowing about these biases um, can help you uh, avoid them um, and, and ultimately be a better doctor. You know, mostly I think it's just interesting. <laughs> In some ways, that's a very depressing, uh, <laughs> very depressing response. Um, that, it's, uh, that it's just interesting when, when I do think that uh, it has had a positive impact in terms of how you think about uh, your own practice and your ability to at least uh, have the ability to kind of diagnose uh, mistakes that have been made in the past so that we can potentially uh, learn, learn from those scenarios or build those little decision aids uh, in the moment. But there's definitely so much, uh, so much work to do. And in terms of our, our response to COVID-19 as well, um, all of us, I think, are, are guilty of wishful thinking, confirmation bias, um, our own perception of risk. Uh, these things are 
are getting in the way of some good decision making that we need to to make and embrace and support collectively. Yeah, I mean there there are other strategies too. I mean, you know, some you know that, that doctors use you know without knowing that they're that you know that they're uh, you know trying to overcome biases. But you know, one is a, to force yourself to think. You know, there's a well-known mnemonic in, in medicine, vitamins, which is just a just a list of category of disease: so vascular inflammation, trauma, autoimmune, metabolic vitamins, you know, you know, neoplastic, traumatic, idiopathic, congenital, I kind of got out of track, um, you know, so that if someone comes in with a symptom to sort of force yourself to think about everything in this category, or I sometimes try to think about things, you know, again, someone with a headache, um, you know, how probable is a, di a certain diagnosis? So, you know, migraines are very common. Um, how alarming is it? you know, migraine, an individual migraine is not dangerous. The disease as a whole is very disabling. But, you know, if you, you know, misdiagnose a migraine, it's not a big deal. Um, and then how treatable is it? So if you uh, misdiagnose a non-treatable disease, you're not necessarily making a mistake as, as di misdiagnosing a treatable disease. So, you know, I might with the, the headache patient say, how probable is a subarachnoid hemorrhage? Oh, not probable. Um, how alarming is it? Extremely. Um, how treatable is it? Very. So that's not a diagnosis that you want to miss. So it's trying to take into account all of those sorts of things. Um, and at least that's how I think about it. And I think sometimes these sort of forcing strategies can be very helpful that way.